Hey, this is Doug with Backcountry Pilgrim, a channel all about hiking, camping, backpacking, and the gear that goes with it. Today we're going to be talking about climbing Half Dome. So, you want to climb Half Dome. The first time that I was getting ready to climb Half Dome, I wanted as much information as I could possibly get, and I scoured the internet, including YouTube, for good intel on what the climb was going to be like, what kind of gear I should bring, what kind of things I should know. And what I'm trying to do for you here is take all of that collective knowledge and put it together for you in a single video. So I'm basically going to be covering two major things. First of all, what do you need to know about the hike in to Half Dome? And then what are the different methods for climbing Half Dome? And what do you need to have and what do you need to know in order to safely do those climbs? Now, I am not here to tell you what you must do to climb Half Dome. I'm going to give you the different options. I'm going to tell you what I think is the best practice for each one. And then I'm going to let you make your own decision, of course. I mean, hike your own hike, climb your own climb. If you want to go straight up the face of Half Dome with no safety gear, or you want to climb with a triple redundancy when the cables are up, whatever, that is up to you, and you need to do what you are comfortable with. The only thing I will call people out on is using an unsafe system in a manner that they act like is safe. There are some videos out there with people doing things that wouldn't even help them in a fall, and yet they act like that's some kind of safety system. Look, if you're not gonna be safe, don't be safe, that's okay. However, it's just irresponsible to videotape yourself doing something unsafe as if you are doing it in a safe manner and then put it out on YouTube for people to see who might be influenced by you and not know any better. I will absolutely call that stuff out. And that is a system that combines a climbing harness, a sling or some kind of cord, and a carabiner that just snaps onto the cable. Now, if you're climbing Half Dome with the cables up, that system is not necessarily that bad because you're not going to experience that much of a fall because you would be arrested by the poles. However, I have seen people use the same system with the cables down, and here is why that is a practically useless system. The first thing you need to realize is that the kinds of cords and slings that people generally use to attach their harness to the carabiner are not meant to be fallen on. Rather, they're meant to hold the climber in a static position where they are putting weight on it, but they are not snapping it as in a fall. How strong a piece of equipment is, is not simply determined by weight, but also how much force is put on it at one time. And these kinds of pieces of gear are not meant to stretch the way a dynamic rope will to save you in a fall. Rather, they're meant to hold you exactly in place. And so if you fall on one of those very far, when you reach the end of that, the trauma to your body could injure or kill you, even though it stops you from falling off the rock. But if you're climbing with the cables down, you've got very long runouts between the tie-in points on the rock. And that means that if you slip, you're gonna fall as if there was no safety system at all, all the way past the attachment point until it finally catches you. Now, even if your gear doesn't fail at that point, because that's not what it was built for, your body may fail because that's not what that equipment was built to do. Now, climbing like that is gonna be faster because the carabiner can just zip up the line behind you or in front of you. It's gonna mean that you can easily snap into the transfer point instead of having to untie your hitches and retie them again. And you could clip in and give yourself a little bit of a break. But as far as a piece of safety gear, it's really not doing much for you. All right, the first thing you need to decide is whether or not your ascent of Half Dome is going to be part of a single day hike or an overnight backpacking trip. Now, there are no campgrounds close enough to Half Dome that you can just drive to to spend the night. The closest backpacker campground is in Little Yosemite Valley, and if you are able to secure a permit, you can backpack and, and cut your trip about in half. Now, the standard route to ascend Half Dome begins in Happy Isles. Walking from the parking lot is going to add about a mile to the round trip, and so what you are looking at in total for parking your car, ascending Half Dome, and coming all the way back is about 16 miles with about 5,200 feet of elevation gain in that single trip. That means in eight miles, you're gonna be going up over 5,000 feet. Now, Half Dome actually sits at 8,800 feet and the valley is at 4,000. So your total 
elevation gain is about 4,800 feet, but there is a little bit of up and down and even some flat areas, if you can believe that, which actually, according to all trails at least, add about 400 more feet of elevation gain across the entire trip. Now, from Happy Isles to Little Yosemite Valley, it's about four and a half miles and about 2,300 feet of elevation gain. So you're actually going to be able to cut that distance and that elevation gain off if you decide to backpack in and stay in Little Yosemite Valley, because that means that all that is left is to hike from Little Yosemite Valley Backpacker Camp to the top of Half Dome. That is about a three and a half mile hike with about 2,900 feet of elevation gain. Now related to the question of day hiking versus backpacking is the issue of food and water. Of course you're going to be carrying all of that on your trip and if you choose to carry your own water that's going to be extremely heavy. Now the last place that you can safely assume that you're going to be able to refill your water is in Little Yosemite Valley at the Merced River. Keep in mind, you're going to want to carry some kind of water purification system with you if you decide to do that. Now, you are going to have to multiply your food by the number of meals you expect to have on the trail. And if things are not in good condition, you might have to be getting water more than once. So those are considerations, too. You do need to drink quite a bit of water on this trip. Believe me, on my first trip up there, I dehydrated, and it was pretty ugly toward the end. So make sure that you have enough water, especially to get you from Little Yosemite Valley to the summit of Half Dome and back. That's a pretty substantial hike all by itself. And for most of that, you are not going to be able to count on getting any additional water. Further, I would dress in appropriate layers. I've got a video on that if you'd like to check it out. Now, related to the question of whether or not you do this as a day hike or as a backpacking trip is the issue of wilderness permits. Yosemite has kind of an on-season and an off-season, and it has to do with when wilderness permits need to be reserved. It's a lottery system, which means that you're going to have to pick those dates and hope you get them, and that affects your ability to get a half dome pass as well. They will let you hike all the way to the base of what's called the sub dome. But at that point, a ranger is going to turn you around and send you back down the hill if you do not have a half dome permit. So a wilderness permit allows you to stay overnight in the Yosemite backcountry. A half dome permit allows you to ascend from the base of Subdome to the summit of Half Dome and back down. Now, if you decide to do this in the off season, which is something I will talk about when I come to how you climb, you can get a wilderness permit simply by walking up to Yosemite Village and near the visitor center or the wilderness center or one of those centers, they'll basically have a kiosk where you just fill out your own wilderness permit, toss it in the box and head off. So you don't need to worry about reserving. You can literally just wake up and the day of, walk up and get your wilderness permit. Another thing that is nice about the off-season is that there is no half-dome permit. That is because the cables are not put up. It is not a very popular time for people to be climbing half-dome, although many people still do. And because of that, you don't need to reserve a half-dome permit, go through the lottery process, etc. So in the off-season, you basically can just pick your date and head on up there. On-season, you got some work to do. All right, now let's talk about what kind of climb you want to experience. Now, at one end of the spectrum, you have full-on rock climbing. This can be anything from a trad climb up the western side on a route like Snake Dyke, or it can mean a free solo right up the face. And probably if you are looking for beta on either of those kinds of climbs, you wouldn't have been clicking on this video anyway. So I'm not going to go into the equipment or the skills needed to do a real rock climbing ascent. Rather, I'm going to talk about kind of the tourist route, the one that most people use. And that is all about the cable system. Some years ago, they installed a cable kind of handrail system on the eastern side of Half Dome. And it's this cable route that most people take when they get to the summit. Now, the cables are up from the Friday before the last Monday in May to the day after the second Monday in October. Basically, they're up from Memorial Day to Columbus Day. Now, the cables are actually secured into the rock of Half Dome. The cables never come off of Half Dome, but they are let down off of the stands that hold them up to act as a kind of guardrail and climbing aid. So normally you've got 50 or so of these poles that the cables go through that keep them at about 
waist height, and this allows you to climb up the cables more safely, and they also provide a place to stand for a break about every 10 feet because the poles are connected by planks that are up against the rock. Now this cable system is about 400 feet tall. So if you can imagine you're climbing something equivalent to a 40-story building, only instead of stairs, you have a 45 to 50 degree ramp of granite that you are going to be ascending. Now in the off season when the cables are down, that doesn't mean that the cables are off of Half Dome, it just means that they are literally lying down on the rock because all of those poles and those planks are removed for the off season. Now people still choose to climb during this time, but the way you do it is fairly different because now the cables, instead of serving as a kind of handrail and climbing aid, are now basically what is going to keep you attached to the rock as you climb, other than the friction that your shoes provide. So climbing Half Dome with the cables down is a very different experience than climbing with them up. So once you have decided whether this is gonna be a day hike or a backpacking trip, you then have to decide whether you're going to want to try to climb Half Dome on season with the cables up or off season with the cables down. Now there are numerous reasons to consider both. As I've mentioned, in the on season, you need a permit to climb Half Dome and they only release about 300 per day. Now, that doesn't seem like very many, and if you're in the lottery trying to get your dates, it can be very frustrating. But I want you to stop and consider for a moment what it is like staring up a 400-foot cable route with 300 people standing there that day. Now, of course, not everybody is going to be climbing at exactly the same time, but a lot of them will because if you don't want to climb in pitch darkness and you don't want to be up there when the thunderstorms roll in, there is kind of a window of opportunity on that clock and a lot of people are going to be trying to make that climb at that time. Now, the problem with this is not just that there's a crowd and crowds aren't very fun, it's that there can be a serious safety issue. You are kind of dependent on the people above you not to freeze up and not be able to move off the cable, which happens fairly often. You're hoping that they don't slip and fall and knock you down or knock the person down ahead of you and then they fall and knock you down. Further, because most people take their breaks about every 10 feet at those planks, if you get caught in between two planks and it's a really hard place to keep your footing, you may have to stand there for several minutes waiting for someone to get out of your way. Another problem with climbing with the crowds is that typically you've got people going up and down at the same time and there is not very much room between the cables. You can easily grab both of them with your hands. So you can imagine somebody wearing a backpack with maybe some trekking poles sticking out. As they try to go past you, they're probably gonna be jostling around, you're knocking into each other, your bags are hitting each other, and all this is happening while you're hanging on to a cable standing on a 45 degree piece of granite hundreds of feet above the place where you fall thousands of feet. Uh, it can be intimidating. It's not a good place to be knocked around. So while it may seem to be the wise move to go in the on season when you have a permit and you have the cables up, those cables create a situation that is actually fairly dangerous. Another problem with climbing with the cables up is that if you do want some kind of backup safety system to keep you on the cables if you slip or fall, every single time you come to one of those poles, which is about every 10 feet, you've got to stop and move your safety clips, carabiners, knots, whatever, over those poles onto the next section. And if you want to stay tied in the whole time, you've got to do it twice every section because you've got one to make the transfer and one to back up while you're making the transfer. This is a huge cost of time and energy, both of which are not something you really want to be losing out a whole lot on while you're trying to make this 400 foot climb. Now, the majority of people do not use any kind of safety gear while they are climbing with the cables up. However, I don't necessarily think that's because they are super brave or super talented, but because they just don't think about it or realize that this is a very dangerous place and perhaps they don't have the gear or they have no idea what to get. Personally, I would not want to be on the side of Half Dome unless I was clipped into those cables somehow. And when you're climbing with the cables up, that's pretty much all you probably need because the poles are so close together that you're likely only going to go 10, maybe a maximum of 15 feet before your safety system kicks in and locks you onto one of those poles. All right, so if you have decided that you are going to climb Half Dome in the on season, you've got your permits, and you are at the base of the cables, what I would recommend is a climbing harness with a sling 
or a personal anchor system that is going to let you use a big carabiner to snap onto the cables, and you want two of those so that as you move one over the pole, the other one is still connected. That way you're connected all the time. Now, the downside to that is that it does take some time. It does sometimes involve some leaning that isn't a lot of fun in order to grab onto those. But at least if you slip or if somebody slips into you, you aren't going to fall very far before you get stopped. And then you can kind of collect yourself and get back up again. Now, one thing almost nobody does is climb up the cables barehanded. Almost everyone wears gloves. Uh, this is going to be important for most people because you don't want to be getting sweaty and slippery up there. It is just a wound cable that is about 15 millimeters wide. Now, for ascending, I like really super grippy gloves. And the gloves I had were just a bomber grip that you almost couldn't slide if you wanted to. However, that exact same grippiness makes them fairly difficult to come down the cables in because they want to grip so hard you basically have to tear them to pieces to get them to slide down the cable. So you may even want to bring a backup pair of gloves, something just kind of standard leather climbing glove type thing that will give you enough friction to hang on to the cable when you need to, but also enough to slide because believe it or not, coming down, you want to be moving. Last, you want to look at your shoes. Half Dome is not really something you want to have some big hiking boots on. But the main thing that you need to have is something that is very grippy. The more grippy your shoes are, the better you're going to do, because Half Dome is really kind of a friction slab. You're not really climbing using holds or anything. There are a few on the way up for your feet. But in general, you're just relying on friction. If you want something really grippy, meant for climbing rock like that, you can try some approach shoes. These shoes are basically in between a climbing shoe and a trail runner, so they have enough flexibility for you to be able to hike around and move around, but they also have the kinds of stiff toe, grippy bottoms that climbers use to ascend rock. Okay, so why would anybody climb Half Dome in the off-season? Well, again, number one, you don't need a wilderness permit if you'd like to backpack in and get a good night's rest before you make the ascent of Half Dome. Now, the downside is that the off-season is the off-season for a reason. It is usually very cold. There is probably going to be snow on the ground. There may be ice on the ground. And the snow and ice that is sitting on top of Half Dome and on top of Sub Dome may be melting and running rivulets of water right down your path and now you've got wet rock to climb on. Another reason to climb in the off-season is because there are far fewer people. Although people do climb Half Dome regularly in the off-season, you're probably looking at zero to a dozen people at any given time versus 300 almost guaranteed. Another nice thing about climbing the cables when they're down is that if you use the correct safety system, you can stop anytime you want to kick back and relax. And that is because you're going to be wearing a safety system that locks up at any point and not just when it slides down to one of those poles, because the poles aren't there. Now, the downside to that is that it does require a lot more physical strength, balance, confidence, etc. to get up those cables when you are basically using them to climb instead of getting to stand on boards and that sort of thing. However, back on the side of climbing with the cables down is that you've only got maybe half a dozen of those transfers where you've got to untie one system and retie it and then move it past a junction point versus 40 or 50 if you're having to do it every single time you come to a pole. Gear-wise, what you're going to want is, again, a climbing harness and something to attach some special cords to the cables. You get those plus a couple carabiners and you are in pretty good shape. Now the basics of this safety system are going to be a climbing harness. This is what goes around you. Attached to that harness is going to be something that connects you to the cable. This could be anything from a simple sling to a long prusik cord or a personal anchor system. And then use the other end to attach to the cable by using a special kind of climbing knot called a prusik or a Clem Heist or something else. I will get to those in a minute. And those special knots allow you to slide up the cable, but they will lock if tension is put on them. And the basic idea is that once you have tied one of those hitches onto the cables and you are attached to it, you can pull yourself up the cable and then let go and you will actually still be attached to the cable through that system. Now, how long of a system that is and everything is gonna depend on you. So what I would recommend doing is just climbing up to the first transfer and back down again 
and just see if you like the way the system works. If you don't, adjust it. If you do, you can just keep climbing. Now, between your ability to choose your dates, to easily spend the night the day before your ascent, to avoid crowds that can cause danger from numerous directions, the fact that you can stop at any time and still be secure, that your falls will be almost negligible if it even happens, and the fact that you've only got maybe half a dozen changeovers instead of 40 or 50, it may be the case that you decide that climbing with the cables down is actually safer than climbing with them up. If you're going to do that, I would strongly recommend getting the gear that I mentioned earlier and then getting some know-how so that you know what to do with it once you get up there. And the main thing you need to know is how to tie friction hitches. A hitch is basically a knot that relies on another rope or cable or something for staying together. In other words, it's not tied to itself, it's tied to something else. The most famous and popular of the friction hitches is the Prusik hitch. This hitch begins with a loop. Best practice is to have it at least three millimeters smaller than the thing it is being tied to. Now, that is with climbing rope. On Half Dome, you're looking at 15 millimeter thick cables. These are not going to get the same kind of bite that a nylon flexible climbing rope will. So starting with something that works well on a climbing rope will probably be okay on the cable because these are usually quite a bit smaller. For example, this Sterling hollow block is 6.8 millimeters. Now the reason it's a loop is because the way a Prusik is tied is you go around and around inside the loop and then pull it. And what that does is it creates a little barrel hitch that will slide up and down when you need it to move, but will lock in place if you pull on it or fall on it. A different version of the Prusik loop is something that is a loop, but it already has the bite in it for you, creating a little eyelet that you can put a carabiner through. This ties the same way, but you have something that's a little more obvious what to clip into so that once it's tied onto the cable, you can just snap it in and attach it to your harness. I find that using this particular piece of gear with a clem heist hitch is actually better. The way a clem heist works is you wrap it around and around on top of itself and then simply pull the loop through the top and attach it. The thing I like about this is that it's a little faster, for me at least, to tie. It's a lot faster to untie and it works basically the same way. It will slide up and down the cable and grab you if you put weight on it. I attached these to a personal anchor system. A personal anchor system is a series of belay loops that are put together in a chain. The belay loop is the main connection point on a climbing harness, and what this does is extend it out so that it is the same protection, but it's at a place that you want it. Now, for example, on this one, the pro version that I got, the top loop is quite a bit bigger, and that allows you to feed it through the harness and make a girth hitch out of it, which is super simple and doesn't take any extra gear. So once it is attached, any one of these loops can be part of my anchor system, and I can even reattach this with a carabiner to my harness, and now I have a redundant system that I can use, and it's all on one piece of gear. There are two other popular hitches that you might hear about. One of them is called an auto block. The problem with the auto block is that it is really not meant to arrest a fall. It's not meant to give you a break. It is gonna slide, on those cables, and although it will slow you down, it's not going to stop you if that's what you need. Another connection method is the VT Prusik, or the Valdetain Tress. The VT is extremely strong, and if you actually get the VT Prusik cord, it is made of a material that is gonna handle heating up very well, it's great for descending, but for the ascent, it's just going to unfurl and become a big mess. You may want to try it on the descent, but I personally wouldn't use it on the ascent. All right, I have links to all of this gear that I used on my ascent. I hope you liked this video. If you did, would you mind giving it a thumbs up, subscribe, and hit that bell if you want to be notified the next time videos come out. Until next time, I'm Doug. Thank you for watching. <laughs>